Our next speaker is Amal Grammy. Amal is a professor. Yeah, I'm a bit tall. Um, Amal is a professor at the University of Manuba in Tunisia, where she has been teaching for 20 years. She was one of the front lines of Manuba's successful struggle um, to defy a Salafist seed last year. Today, she's one of the world's leading experts on religion and women's studies. Um, she has multiple contributions to international seminars and political debates. Amal is also a writer and is responsible for the translation program of the intellectual and civilization work in the Tunisian National Center for Translation. Please, big welcome to Amal. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Miriam and the whole organizers for offering me this uh, uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about our uh, one aspect of our activism in Tunisia. My uh, presentation um, is about female bodies in post-revolution Tunisia, and. Uh, I took two cases. First of all, I will speak about the emergence of the niqab in Tunisia and particularly in our university. And uh, secondly, I will uh, talk about the, the co called the feminine uh, activism in Tunisia and uh, especially the case of Amina Sboy. Tunisian women have been represented monolithically and almost invariably, and everybody sees us as unveiled women, well-educated, modern, secularist, and westernized. Our status and achievement and, uh, under bur both Bourguiba and Ben Ali regimes, and particularly our code of personal status, including the ban of polygamy, the right to divorce and to abortion, etc., allowed us to be considered as a model for Arab women. And did the role of Bourguiba in implementing laws in favor of women is essential. In many speech and visits to different towns, Bourguiba encouraged women to take off the veil using many arguments and all expression referring to the veil as a sign of regression and oppression. This, and uh, uh, moreover, the official national media filmed the president publicly removing the veil of some women. This symbolic act was anchored in our memories as women and had an important impact on women's movement. So it was not surprised for us to see uh, those women participating massively in the revolution and in the front row. During the transition period, women's expectations, dreams, were very high. They dream about full equality, reforming inheritance law, to be treated as citizen. But Tunisian women found themselves at a crossroad of intentions, social, cultural, and personal conflict. In the aftermath of the revolution, Tunisia shared the feeling of being, for the first time, free to express themselves. After decades of frustration and oppression, in this new environment, characterized by the mobilization of several groups and the occupation of public sphere, the majority of Tunisians discovered the emergence of new demand. Few weeks after the fall of Ben Ali regime, a group of women protesters claimed their right to wear the niqab. And this is the first time that, as Tunisians, we heard about this issue of niqab. Because in our tradition in Maliki's school, we don't have uh, this idea to put the niqab. It is not related to our heritage culture, neither to our uh, vision of uh, the, the, the visibility of women in public sphere. A week later, 
feminist activists organized a march demanding new rights, full equality, justice, laicity, etc. In fact, street activism mirrored an ideological and social divide in the Tunisian society. The first part is uh, titled Using the Body as a Tool of Resistance, the Right to Wear the Niqab. What was uh, new after the Tunisian Revolution was the diversification of voices about women's rights and the emergence of Islamic gender activism. Islamists affiliated to a with a Nahda party and Salafist women shared the same conviction that both Bourguiba and Ben Ali were against the female Islamic identity and were behind policies and practices that transgressed Islamic principle and percepts. One of these practices was the campaign against veil. To many, the veil was not simply a visible sign of religiosity, disturbing the image of modern state feminism, but also the sign of everything against the modern project. For this reason, the revolution was seen as a liberator from secular authoritarianism, or what we call strong secularism in Tunisia, and Western policies. Finally, Islamist women have the right to wear the veil. Most of them claim the recognition of society, and particularly secularist women or feminists, who sustain that they had the monopoly of representing the Tunisian women. For decades, Islamist women were excluded from history. After the revolution, some of them became agents of change in the society in which their voices had traditionally not, be, not been heard. Nahda decided to empower women affiliated to the party by encouraging them to run for the 2011 election. And uh, here I stress, Another political men decided to uh, empower women. Moreover, the Islamist movement created its icon, an unveiled woman, Suad Abd Rahim, who became a well-known symbol of the Nahda party. She was used in order to represent the openness of Islamist party and its compatibility with modern values. Many f feminists considered the decision of Al Nahda to put Abd Rahim at the top of the list a cosmetic action in order to convince Tunisian and particularly the international community that Al Nahda was a civil political movement which would not implement Sharia. On the contrary, Al Nahda would promote women's rights and pro protect uh, public liberties. After winning the election, and Nahda became the dominant political party. This shift, this shift to the center of political arena encourages political leaders from Nahda to initiate a process of redefinition or restoration of women's rights in terms of Islam. Some of Nahda deputies in the Constituent Assembly, close to the Salafist movement, asked for sexual segregation and the application of Sharia law. But in Nahda was obliged to do many compromises and to acknowledge that it was difficult to change society by force. Tunisians were found not yet ready for what they thought would be reconciliation with their Islamic heritage. Willing to reach their goal rapidly, in Nahda encouraged their fellow and other Islamist allies, such as Salafists, to create Quranic schools and charity associations Moreover, some political leaders and deputies invited preachers from the Gulf countries and asked them to contribute to the process of Islamization of the country. For the first time in their contemporary history, Tunisian people started to debate issues like female circumcision. This is the first time that we heard about these practices. Customary marriage, zawaj orfi, polygamy, rape, forcing girls to wear the veil, child marriage, etc. And even uh, another party allowed some pa uh, Salafist uh, groups uh, to have their own uh, party 
and uh, to defend the idea of having two uh, uh, wives, or moreover, to talk about uh, slaves, jaweri. In the context of political and social polarization, new challenges emerged. Despite the solidarity among women and men during the revolution, conventional gender relationship and stereotypes were re-emerging. Many women worried about the regression impacting their rights and the violence against them in public sphere. On many occasions, women's rights activists were targeted for their ideas, views, dress, or behavior, and were pursued to conform to Islamic norms. Benefiting from impunity, aggressors continued their recruitment of youth, the indoctrination of women, control of their bodies, and attacks on secularists. After being mobilized to take to the street to support the revolution, women's bodies became, after the fall of Ben Ali regimes, the source of contention and debate. The female body for a group of Salafists became an instrument to inflict shame and humiliation as a mode of dressing in an Islamic way. Women's bodies increasingly became markers of the re-Islamization of the country. According to Salafists, Tunisia should be an Islamic state. Since November 2011, very serious incidents broke out of, at the Faculty of Literature, Art and Humanity in Manuba, my university, where a group of Salafist men asked for the right for female students in Niqab to attend classes and sit for exams, single-sex classrooms and a room for praying, and even they asked a professor like me to uh, give up teaching about issues like uh, feminism, gender, uh, etc. And uh, as a professor teaching gender uh, studies and Islamic thought at this university, I took part in the confrontation between uh, my uh, uh, secular students and Salafist groups. And uh, what I found uh, very strange, each time that I started the discu discussion or the debate with Salafists, uh, women wearing the niqab, coming out from outside the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the faculty, uh, which is very strange that um, men are speaking on behalf of women. No students have uh, this uh, possibility to discuss the issue or uh, sh uh, her demand why she's willing to, to wear the niqab. All the time, it's uh, a conversation with me and a man. Uh, it is important to mention that the uh, controversy about the niqab took many months. I was kicked out of my university. Uh, I didn't teach since uh, uh, three months for the three months, and uh, each time that uh, I participate or attend a talk show, I receive threat of death, and mentioning that uh, because I'm teaching also comparative religious, so I was considered as apostate, as women preaching Christianity, uh, and uh, uh, they are asking uh, the administration uh, uh, to uh, stop uh, giving this lady uh, courses because she's uh, disturbing our Islamic heritage. So, for uh, this uh, debate about the niqab, it was uh, um, uh, a long debate in the media and even in the Constituent Assembly, official declaration of our president, Marzuki, and for the first time, we are treated not as citizens, as Tunisian women, but as unveiled. So he addressed us, unveiled women, veiled women, and munaqabet. This is the first time that we heard uh, a president talking to citizens uh, uh, with this expression or terms. Secular feminists who were organized and mobilized after the revolution argued that the niqab is a form of violence against women uh, because it is oppressive and degrading them, but also Qatar and Saudi Arabia and 
all the Wahhabis, preachers, are trying to do their best in order to change the image of uh, secularist women uh, considered for them as a prostitute. So it is time after revolution to make them uh, more modest and more uh, religious, etc. cetera. Uh, based on Islamic culture knowledge, women learn from uh, an early age to view their own bodies as an outside observer and consequently bear their bodies and uh, appearance in public shamefully. But it is important to know that research has confirmed that female body consciousness is linked to lower body self-esteem and higher body shame, as well as lower. Uh, 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 despite the fact that we have many differences among women wearing the niqab, due to uh, age or class or level of education and political affiliation, these women do share one crucial element, visible invisibility in so-called secular culture, uh, country. The increasing uh, visibility of women wearing the niqab during the transition period is playing an important role in the political sphere. The more politicized Muslim women are, the Muslim visible they become. And which is very important in the, uh, these uh, photos that uh, the term or the lexicon used by our student. Uh, we are uh, uh, talking about rights in human rights lexicon and terms, which is a new form of expressing their demand uh, in Tunisia. Because uh, as you know, uh, we are familiar of uh, another language, another uh, uh, lexicon to express uh, their demand, but uh, which is very, very uh, 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 strange, this, this hijacked of the whole package of human rights term. By adopting legal language and appropriating the discourse of human rights activists, Salafist women were trying to show that they were not under the influence of men. They used a discourse based on universal human rights, according to which all women have the same right, regardless of their ideologies. But the use of terms such as my right, I'm a citizen, my freedom to wear the niqab, did not mean necessarily that Salafists had the same understanding of human rights and the same signification. Apparently, it, it, is, it is a pragmatic way to reach some goals and the support of human rights activists all over the world. The second part now, feminine in the Tunisian marketplace, a new form of resistance, which is very symbolic in this appearance of uh, Amina uh, uh, feminine is the use of Arabic language, which is considered as sacred, the language of the Quran. And she used it on her body, which uh, many uh, uh, ulama, uh, religious people, uh, consider that a body of women is all the time uh, an impure, impure, you know? Uh, so, this new form of expressing them, uh, uh, herself uh, uh, shocked, of course, the whole society. And uh, even one Salafist preacher was invited to talk show, refused to sit on the seat assigned to him, arguing that the chair was impure after Amina had sat there a few days early. He declared that Amina deserved to be flogged if not lapidated, Amina's photo shocked fundamentalism and disturbed the po public opinion. It revealed also how conservative many parts of society still were. Even feminists and what so-called Democrats or modernists or progressists frowned upon her action and would not support her at the beginning. Most of them asked, why now? Why this? For them, Amina reduced the complexity of women's struggle to the superficial issue of dress 
and dress at the time when feminist activists in Tunisia were walking a tight rope in a changing gender climate. The relationship of Amina with Femen, a group that imposed a Western brand on feminism and discriminately over various culture and society around the world, also made matters worse for both Amina and feminists. Their particular naive and simplicity emphasized on veiling and its removal as a form of liberation was particularly ridiculed by Arab women who rose to oppose this high-handed assumption regarding their culture and tradition. By distancing themselves from Amina, activists wanted to protect their image and their interests in a context of rude confrontation with radical Islamists, political violence, and the spread of terrorism. Uh, could you uh, show the, the next one? Yes. Uh, we are uh, Tunisian women, uh, revolutionary, we are not slave, and we, we, do, we don't like uh, 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 naked uh, body. However, Amina did not give up her activism. And uh, on May 18, 2013, the Congress of Salafists Ansar Sharia was held in Qairawan, well-known cities of religious men. Amina decided to oppose them, those extremists. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the police arrested her taking her to jail for being in possession of illegal weapons and discreting a cemetery. She was jailed for over two months. It is important to mention that in a context where Salafis started the Islamization of Tunisia, convincing or forcing women to wear the niqab, the act of Amina was considered as an act of rebellion against masculinized society or group. When she took off her clothes, it was not for voyeurism, it was to protest against oppression, rather than, rather than surrender her body to be consumed by the male gaze, to be a symbol of masculine honor and patriarchal standards of femininity. She claimed the freedom of her body. This body is no more the symbolic propriety of the community and serving as a tool to reaffirm the Islamic cultural identity. In doing so, Amina simply stated that she was free, but the paradox was the fact that Amina was obliged to cover her body and to wear the traditional Tun Tunisian safsari at the court. And interestingly enough, feminists and modernists suddenly changed their position and showed a concern about Amina. She embodies a new generation who saw the revolution as the promise for change and new perspective. Activists organized the demonstration and asked for the liberation of Amina. Inevitably, though, those cases confirm that women who seek to transgress the limits placed on their bodies end up exiled, like our filmmaker, uh, uh, Nadia Alfeni. They use their bodies to counter the cultural hegemonic discourse about women. It is evident that the nudity of women is particularly offensive to people who believe that women's bodies are protected and the private property of men within families. For this reason, barriers would be raised to prevent cultural penetration which represent evil. Fundamentalists consider that once in the public sphere, women's bodies should be regulated and disciplined by the male gaze, which ensures that the masculinity of the public domains remains protected from the potential of chaos and reduced by non-masculine, transgressive bodies. The condition of entrance into the, into the public sphere, male-dominated space, are often marked by prescriptive dress and body redu 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 regulation intended to defensize female sexuality. Concluding remark, the two cases discussed can help shed some light on the role that women's bodies play in post-revolution Tunisia 
and how women's bodies become spaces of domination and resistance. The questions that can be raised are whether the battles are for authenticity, cultural dominance, political control, or a simple clash between secularism and emerging radicalism in Tunisia. How did women use their bodies to alter the existing culture pattern? And here uh, uh, we have witnesses a new phenomenon in Tunisia, young girls using the traditional uh, uh, wearing in, uh, in white uh, of our uh, grandmother, etc. But the next one, uh, please. But this is also a counter discourse. Uh, using the national fl Tunisian flag as a fashion in order to be visible. And of course, uh, 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 the quoted from one famous poet in Tunisia, uh, uh, Tunisian women uh, are uh, one and half more than uh, considering uh, uh, they are uh, playing with the uh, inheritance uh, versus uh, considering uh, the part of women half. So we are more than one and half. Thank you very much. Okay.